Afternoon, everybody. And springboarding off what was just being discussed regarding the use of airplanes during the First World War, we're going to go into a little more in depth on how that worked for both sides during the war. Uh, now, to begin with, what was decided, what was called a World War One flying ace, as many were called, was were, that's on the western side. On the German side, they referred to as experts. What that means is, if you had five or more enemy kills, you were given the title of ace or expert. That's what that meant, respectively. Now, moving on with the German side first, the one who has the most renown in throughout history is a gentleman by the name of Baron Manfred von Richthofen. Now, he was in Germany, of course, and he fought against both sides during the war. It wasn't just solely against the western side. And he eventually got what was a triplane. There were three levels on his plane. And he, his techniques and his ability to maneuver, dodge, and just outfight everybody really began to take off right after the battles of Somme and Verdun. Because that's where dogfighting, which was what meant when you saw the planes fighting, going up and around, swerving around each other, fighting literally like a dogfight. That's where that term came from. He was well-renowned. And after his squadron won their 16th engagement, the journalists referred to them as the Flying Circus because they were entertaining to watch or just the way they were able to pull things off. <clears throat> now, he was very well feared throughout the British and the French ranks for obvious reasons. And what happened was in July of 1917, they were having another engagement where he was fighting two different uh, pilots from the British Air Force and they did notice while they were firing at him something changed and he began doing a nose dive and he, he was visibly off they couldn't figure out what was going on and they wondered when they went back to their to their hangars like did we injure him the fact is they did a bullet caused to splinter part of the Baron's skull and he was able to go back to Germany and and not was saying that the best medical of the uh, help at the time they were unable to do really anything for him the wound never properly healed and for the remainder of the time for the red baron he would get the worst migraines he was in so much pain he could hardly even see straight and so when he got back into flying a short time later he was visibly off he didn't have any kills for weeks <clears throat> and finally what happened was in april of 18 1918 he was fighting again, and he was uh, in a dogfight with some Canadian Air, Air Force people, and they were on the Allied side, and there was unsure exactly what took place, but the Baron took a kind of a dive, and he crashed into a group of trees on the French side of the line. Now, the pilot behind him, the Canadian pilot, not being a glory hound, he chose not to actually say that, yes, I killed the Red Baron, because he didn't actually know if he had. And it was later shown through future evidence that he was actually shot down in theory by an Australian gunner crew on the ground. So when he actually passed away, there was <clears throat> there, the British gave him full military honors to where they actually said about the Red Baron. They I'll read this to you. They actually they they did a the planes dropped them all over the aerodrome and Cappy with the message to the German Flying Corps. Rickmeister Baron von Manfred von Richthofen was killed in aerial combat on April 21st, 1918. He was buried with full military honors from the Royal Air Force. So that's something they did, and he was eventually re brought back over to Germany. So at the end of his career, the Red Baron would have over 80 kills during his time. Now, another individual who would actually go down as a, in history on the German side was a gentleman by the name of Ernst Udet. He was a pilot as well, and I can't give one-tenth of the credit for all the different things he did. Some of the things he did were something you'd see out of a movie, the way he would go out of his way to protect his planes and to save his aircraft. He did so many incredible things. and that he, So I encourage you to look up more on, on Ernst Udet to look him up on that, because it's really a brilliant story, which I can't fit into here right now. And at the end of the First World War, he had 62 Allied kills. <clears throat> And what happened to him was after the war, he would actually work for different companies, flying in airplanes well, for film crews all over the world. He'd do things like that. And finally, once the Second World War came along, he was made a uh, general in the German Luftwaffe. And while he did not subscribe to the politics of the Nazi party, he did what many did at the time, and they simply supported their country versus what their government was preaching. And so... 
what happened was, and after the the failed Battle of Britain in 1940, where the Luftwaffe failed to destroy the British and knock them out of the war, he was made to take the fall for it. He was made the scapegoat. And I've heard two different things. One said that he was forced to commit suicide after that to take the fall. And another source I was remember reading was that he chose to take his own life because he refused to serve Nazism. So he actually did die by suicide in, the, in 1941. Now, another World War I flying ace who has much more renown for a much darker reason was a man by the name of Hermann Goering. Now, in his time, he would also fight quite bravely as a pilot, and he would also go on to get 22 enemy kills. And he, notwithstanding, he was a little different, a little... Uh, little out there you could say he was a very good commander and he did earn the respect of his men and after the war he actually flew for the Swedish Swedes for a while working working up there and in 1930s he met Adolf Hitler and you know where the story goes from there now another remarkable part about Hermann Goering is at the end of the, the World War II in, the, in Europe the day after Germany surrendered he hit, um, after Hitler had committed suicide, Goering went to an army air, a U.S. Army Air Bay field in Austria, and he offered his formal surrender to the commander of that area, saying, I would rather have my surrender be to a fellow airman. And he gave him his pistol, and they shook hands, and him and his family went in, and they had a party right there inside the hangar. They'd sing, they'd dance, they had food, and meanwhile you have the leadership of London, Paris, Moscow, and Washington saying, what is this? Turns out it's an old airman's code of how things work among airmen that trounces local politics. So those are some of the things that happened with those particular events with pilots during the First World War. There you go.